let's talk just real briefly about kind of how you got started and how you ended up in Colorado and well um started painting i i was always a pencil artist up until college that's all i ever wanted to do was just draw and then all my art heroes at the time happened to be painting and i thought okay i got to see what this is all about and when i first started painting it is so different from drawing i mean they're they're just two different languages yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and i uh um i i learned early that i needed a lot more work and it was going to be a long journey and I started painting outdoors and that really changed changed my life changed how I paint changed everything um so that was um you know that's how I I am where I am now um I owe most of it to painting outdoors and just painting 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 um but that's that's uh and I always wanted to be a a fine artist too. I, I went to school, ended up with a graphic design degree because it was the fastest track out of college. <laughs> so I ended up with a graphic design degree, worked in graphic design, um, not, not in a traditional sense, but I worked for a photo lab doing Photoshop. And strangely enough, that kind of honed my color sense quite a bit. And, um, Side note, I got to meet Richard Schmidt and worked on a lot of his books while I was there. So it was, it was, it was it oh. yeah, yeah, I had, I had a um, close up and personal view of Schmidt's entire portfolio because I could just zoom in and see the brushwork. And okay. so it was like being at an art gallery. Um, but all of that, you know, 12 years after I started plein air painting, I, I went into full-time art and haven't looked back. That was 2000, let's see, 2012. So, and here I am. What influenced you to um, paint the way that you, that influenced you in the style? I'm hearing somebody in the background. So if you're not speaking, do you mind turning your mute on? Um, you know, I owe most of what I hear. And actually, I can. I'm just gonna mute, folks, real quick, and and just know you can unmute anytime you need to. Um, you know, I I owe my style and how I paint now, a hundred percent to painting outdoors. Mm -hmm. And I think early on when I was drawing, I was doing very hyper-realistic drawings. And now my my method with paint is more loose, impressionistic with the brushwork. Um, larger paintings, I, I still get fairly uh, detailed with, but the approach is very loose. And that comes from needing speed outdoors, trying to paint fast outdoors, trying to capture moments instead of scenes um so capturing that really um teaches you to paint quickly absorb the information quickly and get it down quickly and i still use that approach in the studio and the other thing that i learned along the way is uh, and i used to when i first started painting i would draw on the canvas and fill it in with paint and i thought this is so not how this medium is meant to be used and over time you know I converted that paintbrush into a drawing tool and so now it's you know how can you draw and arrange shapes and create line with shape rather than you know line um, and that changed the way I, I paint so no longer am I drawing at all with you know traditional drawing tools it's using that brush and making, you know, drawing with a brush is what I call it. And, and that's a, that's been a monumental change to, to my work. Very nice. Um, well, I know that you have some things for us tonight and I would love for you to first talk about what your goals are for us as artists when we do the two day workshop on March 2nd and 3rd and what you hope to accomplish and help us with in that. Well, and I think almost every workshop, I think my goal is more 
teaching how to see a landscape in terms of, you know, with, with an artist's eye, which is very different, I think, than seeing seeing a landscape as a tourist or a photographer or a normal person. <laughs> I mean, we're not normal. We're artists. We got to look at things, you know, very differently. But to translate all of that color into paint, I think is huge. It, it's, uh, um, you know, it's, it, it's one of those things that you don't think about initially. You just think, once I look off on that mountain and I see purple, I just grab purple. And colors and context have a very different feel and look. So that purple that we think we see is probably gray of some sort. I always joke with my wife. I'm like, you know, um, look at that beautiful gray out there. <laughs> because almost every color is gray, just a, a slightly different variety of it. And all of that comes in and I, and I teach this in context of atmosphere. So how do you create atmosphere um, through using color? So I wrap all of this information around creating atmosphere in our work. Very so if there, I guess there's two things that I'm really harping on. One is atmosphere and one is learning to see a landscape. So yeah, I think those are both hi. Real, real quick. My daughter just wants to say oh. hi. Hello. She loves, she loves Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> you live in Colorado okay. now, right? Yeah, we're in Colorado. But what area? Uh, Fort Collins area. So just north. Is that where the, you grew up? Yep. Born and raised here. Oh. Very good. Now, um, question: Do you want to hold questions until the end, or do um, you... I can take them really quickly now. I wanted to address. Have fun at dance. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to address really quickly too. There are a lot of different mediums, and um, I always encourage all mediums to, you know, to take my workshop. Or um, I was mentoring for a while with Mastrius, and we had every medium you know, under the sun. And I, I come from uh, a pencil background into oils, you know, it, it, it's mostly what I teach is uh, formal stuff, um, color, color stuff. You know, I, I think the designing a painting translates across all mediums. So there's a lot for everyone. And, and I, there's only a few things when I go into oil specific stuff, like, how to put paint down through through an oil painter's eye, but there's not a lot of that. Most okay. of it is is you know whatever you come in with. I don't want to change that. Does anybody have any questions so far, Leanne? Yeah. Do you not have a mentorship group right now at Masters? I don't right now. the The one that um, I'm doing is a is the workshop, the two day workshop. It's just scheduling. I'm trying to get on top of a few new shows that I took on this year. So this year's kind of slammed, but I, I want to look into it again for next year, starting one up. Um, uh, my my schedule is pretty hectic until about October, maybe November this year. And then I'm hoping things will slow down a little bit. So. Great. Any other questions mm -hmm. so far? When you say you don't draw, but you do draw with the paint, I'm curious to know how much of a uh, drawing or outline you actually put on your canvas before you begin to paint. You know, I really don't, uh, not at all. So when I say I don't draw, uh, I mean, not with in the traditional sense of line. It's more about getting those shapes in the right spot. I know, um, you know, drawing is, is often, I think, not really precisely to find. So I, I don't mean I don't draw, but but what I do is, and I'll show you, I've, I've got some examples of how I start. And um, I'll make sure I hit on that because really what I do is, is I put in place different um, abstract lines of intersection. So say where the edge of a barn meets the horizon. Well, that would be a line that I would want to get fairly precisely in a location because it involves a um, a focal point. So I want to get that in a fairly precise location. 
Um, but I don't draw the barn and fill it in. I'll draw one plane of the barn and another plane and another plane, um, you know, which, which is using, I, I think, using the brush to its fullest because if you can draw one shape and get that whole shape right, you're saving time. Um, I, I always think, how would I do this with a pencil now? Because I'm so ingrained in painting shapes all at once it would be hard for me to grab a pencil and just draw now i'd like to try it just for <laughs> see if i can remember how but it, i bet it's you i bet you haven't lost language. it yeah but don't that, go back i bet you haven't lost it so do you, <laughs> you want to um show us then yeah yeah okay. let me pull can up I, can I, I ask a question in the meantime yeah sure, you Matt? bet thank you i'm christine pleasure to meet you hey nice and, to meet you and I've seen your work, and uh, and I'm a fan, safe to say. Thank so you. when when you go out, plein air, do you paint what you see, or do you do what I do and take the essence of the place and make it your own story? You know, I I paint more for the essence of the place. So oh. I, you know, um, I do paint what I see in terms of atmosphere. I try to get atmosphere as precise as I can. And that almost emboldens me to change things. If I want to move a tree, well, I've got the atmosphere for it. So I know if I want to move it over here, it's going to be the same colors. It's just going to be in a different place. Or if I have the atmosphere for the mountain, you can make peaks where there weren't because you have that color down. So I'm really trying to be super precise about color. But as far as where the objects are, I'll move those for the sake of the painting. Almost always. There's almost always something that's going to move or shift. Um, and, and you get to, as the artist, you get to choose how close you want to be to that spot or how far away from it you want to be. Um, I always, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I joke that rock climbers aren't going to want to use my mountains to plan their next route because they're not, <laughs> I mean, they're so different. Um, but having said that i'll have that same rock climber say i know right where that was and it couldn't be further from different different from the actual mountain so so it's amazing how far away you can get as long as you grab the essence like you said people are going to recognize it as that spot and, and sometimes it'll be more powerful statement because it's your statement i agree thank you yeah you bet um let let me just share a couple of things i wanted to I, I show a slideshow um let me pull up the right enjoying the video don't forget to like subscribe and click the bell to be notified when new masters videos are added let me see so hopefully this is nope that's <laughs> that's kind of a jokey picture of me painting outdoors i don't know if you is this showing up uh th there's no dorky picture of you showing up oh <laughs> <laughs> there's just a picture of a mountain and a palette oh no, there's there's a dorky picture of you yeah that's a yeah that that wasn't what i was going to show you but it is kind yeah, of for real? i don't i don't paint that big outdoors that was a joke picture. okay i was going to say wow where's your ladder <laughs> nope i shared the wrong <laughs> you need a fire truck to stand on. <laughs> I'm doing a Charlie's, um, Charlie Hunter's podcast on Wednesday, so I I sent him that picture to <laughs> to talk about. Um, give me one second here. Sure. Take your time. Here we go. Okay, now. Okay, so. When I, the slideshow I, I show is probably, it, it's the only, it, it's a, I equate it to getting the technical stuff out of the way so we can have fun and paint. Because a lot of it is, like I was saying, learning how to see. And so I dive into that with the slideshow. And I talk about three components of color, temperature, chroma, and value. And the way I, I try to describe that is how to create atmosphere and part of that is knowing that those colors depending on context are going to feel very different and one of the slides i show is this one where i talk about um 
on the left side, this gray patch, this neutral gray patch seems much warmer than the same gray patch on the right, which seems much cooler. And it's because this gray patch, it's, it's a neutral gray, but because it's surrounded by orange, it seems almost blue. And on the left, because it's surrounded by blue, it seems slightly orange. And that gives us, and you can see that's the same gray as I lift that veil, but we can use that because that same gray, you may look at that and say, never in a million years would I pick gray for the color of light on a distant mountains. We all, we think, oh, it's got to be yellow or orange. But if we, you know, open up our mind to surrounding that color by different colors to affect its feel to us, you can see as we zoom out of this painting that that gray is what worked as light on that mountain. And by using that, and, and the reason I say that that's important is because if you can get by with gray for light in the mountain, look at how much color it opens up in the foreground. It opens up all of those saturated colors that wouldn't have any effect if we used, say, this color back here. If we did that, we'd be flattening atmosphere. So it's really a way of uh, using color, uh, you know, opening up and freeing and liberating ourselves from the use of traditional colors back here. So, now, do you use a, a particular palette or do you change your colors around on it? Or do you kind of have your same, you know, standard colors? I, I have this, the same palette. In, in fact, let me... Uh, going to try and remember which direction my palette is. Oh, it's up here. Let me just zoom through some of this, actually. And should we have these colors ready to go for the workshop? Because we're going to be painting, um, doing some painting with you, right? Yeah, exactly. That That's kind of um, my thought is that, you know, the, the first day I'm going to do the slideshow. I've got a couple of slideshow. One's on design, one's on color. And then we're then I'm going to do a demo and and more along a paint paint along demo, so we'll all paint and talk about these same things, and um, I'll I'll send a supply list out to. Okay. I'm not sure there there might be one already attached to Masterius, but if not, I'll send the supply list because I think I did send one in, but okay. I'll double check on that. Thanks. Um, but but basically, these are the colors I use. It, it's always the same. I have the same palette, you know, whether I'm painting in Mexico or California or Alaska. Um, and it's primaries. It's all primary colors, yellows, reds, and blues. And one thing that always strikes people is that I include this viridian as part of my blue family. And if you can think about it like that, it's the first step in divorcing yourself of traditional color names and, and descriptions. Because if you think about green, it really is truly a warm blue. And if you think about it as a warm blue, you've opened up a way of using that color slightly different than maybe you would have before. It's not just for trees anymore. So um, I used to think it'd be great if you only ever had to buy one magic tube of paint and you just squeezed it out in a long row like this from warm to cool it would work it would it would hammer out every color you ever needed so if anyone comes up with that let me know dave can you go back a couple of slides you have a scene there with a pond with a mountain in the back i've been looking for that scene to paint it and i just can't locate it and no up more up more yeah yeah that one right there oh this one is that in logan's pass and glacier national park no, this is actually a lake of glass in Rocky Mountain National Park. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, if you if you ever get a chance to go there, it's it's incredible. Lake I mean, of glass. Yeah, I know. I can see that. It's beautiful. Thanks. Yeah. It, I, I've gotten a lot of paintings. It, it, the, the only downside is it's a trek to get in there. But once you're in there, it's it's amazing. It's hard to lug paints there. <laughs> yeah. um, but... But in, in one of the ways I, I teach color, too, getting back to this slide, teaching atmosphere is really about these shadow shapes. 
So that that's the big secret to atmosphere is get those shadow shapes correlating across those different uh, planes and you'll have atmosphere. Um, and um, let, let me, I, I wanna, let me stop that. Were there any questions on, on any of that stuff? So that, that's really, that, that's kind of my introduction slideshow. Um, let me see if I can. I have a question. Yeah. So you know how photos, you know, when you're painting outside, that's one thing. But when we're looking at photos, how deceptive they can be because of the variation of lights and darks and blacks. And how do you compensate for that when you're painting from a photo and set up your your palette there? You know, it, it's really it, and I'm going to talk about that in the workshop, too, because a lot of my all of my studio workshops, they're based in plain air principles. So plain air uh, i mean it's what trained me to paint anyway so then when i look at a photo i become fairly adept at knowing what's what the big differences are and um i i think plain air painting is really the key to doing that there's not a lot of shortcuts in between but um and sometimes i tell people even even if you don't paint you just go out and stare at a landscape for an hour and a half it's more fun if you're painting but if you just stare at a landscape you're going to pick up things that a photo will never pick up so i i think there's uh you know plein air painting is really the only only way to reanalyze photos but but we'll hit on a lot of that a lot of the drop-offs so um let me i have a question more toward gear and and schlepping gear. I'm a I'm a schlepper, and I keep trying to lighten my load. So, what's what's your kit look like? So I have um, it's probably about thirty pounds, but I, I use Josh Bean's Prolific Painter. It it kind of folds up into a book. I don't know if I have one really close by, um, it, and all of it fits in a backpack. So all of my gear, the paper towels, my paints brushes my uh pushad box the prolific painter and the prolific painter folds up into about a book size it, it's it's very compact just slides right in the backpack and then my tripod is the other thing and all of it is probably around 35 pounds maybe you know which um seems uh, i it's been a lot heavier <laughs> over time i think that's as light as it's been so understand but uh, and my tripod that's the main thing it's a, it's a carbon fiber tripod you know worth the extra expense for it and it's lasted me it's probably 15 year 15 maybe yeah it's probably 15 years old still going but a sturdy tripod is hugely important and one that definitely the legs can spread out. You know, you're always going to, at some point, run into inclement weather that's going to want to blow your easel over. <laughs> so I think that's important. Make sure the legs can go really wide. I have prolific yeah. painter, and I really like it. Yeah, oh, it, it's great. In, in the When you set it on, it, it's almost like, it, it's the next be best thing to your palette in your studio because it's open um i've painted on other ones where it opens up like a you know like a box and then you're constantly mixing inside that box this it's open and um and big it's a big mixing space and it's really reasonable too um in terms yeah. of price so prolific painter i prolific use edge painter. pro i use the edge, edge pro uh paint book but i'm always looking for lighter and better yeah, I, I've seen those too. And, and, you know, all of them are great now. I, I, I started off, my very first plein air paintings were with a French easel. You know, talk about um, things coming a long way. Um, you know, now they slip into your backpack. So it's great. Thank you. You bet. Any other um, questions? I have one other screen share and, and feel free to ask questions as we go and, th and this will kind of show to address the question of 
Um, is this sharing okay? That this yeah. is sort of a setup of um, how I I, I use. I, I saw someone was using an OBS. I, I use an OBS so that I can get my palette and my painting in the same frame for everyone. What's an OBS? It, it's um. Uh, it, it's a way to use Zoom to, so that you can put multiple cameras into one Zoom. Oh, okay. And, and it it works great because if you, if, if, if you want to have a shot of your canvas, or a camera right on your canvas. And, uh, and, See me, uh, my... If you want to have a, a camera right on your canvas and one right on your brushes, um, this is a way to do it. And you can also pull up the reference photo. Um, that's another thing for the workshop I want to do is send out the reference photos early so that folks will know what, what we're going to tackle when we're in the workshop. But So we're go question, so we're going to use your reference photos we don't need to provide our own? Well, I think both. The first one I'm gonna use we're gonna use my reference photos. The second demo the next day is gonna be optional. You can paint your own reference or my reference. And it, let me just really quickly go over the day structure. What I wanna do on day one is start with the slideshows. We'll break for lunch. And then the second half of the day, I'm gonna start with a demo and folks will paint along if they want. Some folks will choose to just watch, which is great too. And then that evening, I'll have anyone who painted send me their images. And we'll start the second day with a quick critique of what we did the day before. And I use Photoshop to critique and kind of show things using Photoshop. And then after that, I'll do another demo. And folks are welcome to either paint along or do their own painting. And then after that, we'll talk about you know, what everyone did. I'll have folks send me images throughout the day, that second day. So the second day will be more open-ended. The first day, a little bit more structured. So that'll be the, and I think we'll get a lot done in two days. Um, at least we'll, our brains will be full by the second day. So. Yeah. Cause it's a, it's an eight hour day with each day with an hour for lunch. So it's, it's yeah. really packing a lot of stuff in. What are the dates again? March 2nd, Saturday, March 2nd, and Sunday, March 3rd. Yeah, and there, cool. is, there is still room to um, sign up. Are the links on your Facebook page? I, I didn't see any links for the registration. Yeah, me neither. I, I have a link on my website directly to the oh. registration. So um, davesantianas.com. And if you want to go straight to Mastrius. Com, there, there's a link there too if you go under um courses. one of the menu items i think is courses and, and you okay, just go down great. there so, thank you you bet um this is you know let me actually back this up so this was an actual zoom demo i did and someone asked me about the drawing that i do this is my michelangelo drawing i do before a, a painting so again, all I'm doing is looking for how how can I roughly put in where I want the lake? And, and here's the reference photo over here. But where do I want the lake? And you know, the lake is obviously the big player there. And then by by time I get going, that's that's all drawing done with the brush. So by using, you know, the background color and the local color you can really refine edges and make edges as sharp or as loose as you want. So it gives you ultimate control of creating edges. So it went from really from this, I'll just click a few places in between here. So you can see it, it coming together. And what that allows, because you're not bound by this structured drawing, you're free to move things throughout the painting. Um, it, it's what I really love about painting is it's so fluid and sculptural. It's, it, it's, a, it's a really fun process. 
uh, just excuse me for interrupting. Ane just posted the link in the chat, so okay. you guys can take a look at that because I'm kind of new to all of the crazy you can do on Zoom. So <laughs> I I was also going to say right now we have um you can get the base membership for free for a month. So if you have that, then you actually are a member. Um, and then you get a bit, bit of a discount on the course as well. So I'm just going to put in the base membership link, which um, you get your first free month for free. And that gives you access to our weekly events that we have. Like tomorrow, we have a really cool uh, watercolor demo on birds tomorrow night. So anyway, I won't interrupt anymore. Go ahead, Dave. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate You're welcome. it. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's kind of yeah, Scott. Yeah. I have a question, question, not on the March 2nd, 3rd, but on the um uh, mentoring program. And I think you if I understood you right, you're not really visiting that this year. Is that the idea? Yeah, I, I can't do it this year. I've done them in the past. I did one for oh about a year and a half. And it was it was great because it allows um for much more in-depth things. And I kind of, the, the way I did my mentorship, it was very fluid. Um, it was based on the needs of the group. So as you know, I, I do still, I started my mentorship with that same slideshow just to kind of get everyone on the same page and speaking the same language. But then as we go, you see different needs for different groups. And then I'll address those in, you know, in various ways, either through a demo. I did some demos during my mentorship some slideshows. Um, so a lot of different different ways to do it. Sometimes we even just talked about the business side of art. Mm -hmm. So very, very fluid and open. Generally, I'm oh, sorry, Scott. I, I was just going to say generally the way that it works is you join um, a group, a mentor, and the meeting is you spend some time, the teacher's teaching something to you, and then uh, they'll go through critiques from the homework from the meeting before the month before, and then, you know, new things like that. So it's really fun. Okay, great. I would just say for anybody who hasn't uh, worked with Dave before, I was a subscriber to your website uh, last year and uh, boy, I appreciate the interaction. And I sent you a picture and you sent a comment and I said, oh, this is great. You're thinking the same way I'm thinking. And uh, it was really, really terrific. Uh, so I'm impressed by your responsiveness as well as your painting. So. Well, thanks. I thought your name looked familiar. <laughs> but as soon as you came on, I said that. Yeah. Well, it's, it's good to put a face to the name. Right. We had, yeah. But, but, so. um, but yeah, I try, try to, um, yeah, I, I try to be as responsive. And people, um, they kind of chuckle when they realize I'm really the one running. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when people, like, I'm tech support, I'm, painting support. <laughs> janitor if you have a painting problem at 3 a.m i might not respond but tech, su tech support i might <laughs> I, think I, I think i told my wife michelangelo responded to me so that was <laughs> that's funny <laughs> dave what did you find the most challenging thing about painting outside and what did you find was the most rewarding thing about that you know i think when i first went out you know it reminds me I, I can't remember who said this when you don't know what you're doing it's easy it's gotten a lot more difficult <laughs> but in a good way because you you push your sensibilities after a while but when i first went out painting um you know i think the most difficult things for me um well it, and it went to my approach because i was I came from a pencil drawing background. I was trying to draw and then fill it in with color. And you just don't have time outdoors to do it that way. So for me, it was, I was up against the clock, but I didn't realize that I had other problems leading to that. Um, so in an hour and a half, I wouldn't have anything close to a finished painting. Now an hour and a half, I, I can grab what I need and pack up and and get out before the rain hits you know it's that type of thing now um the other thing is changing light always frustrated me early but with the approach i use now it's never an issue because you get those shadow shapes down and it doesn't matter what the light does after that so you can 
uh, you can chase the light freely because you have those shadow shapes already rendered. And so it liberates you from being up against a time deadline. So, can you expound on the shadow shapes a little bit and what exactly how you do that, what you mean? Yeah, and it's really kind of the at the heart of how I teach atmosphere is if you can get the darkest dark on each plane laid in, you're going to have atmosphere. Um, and the, the darkest dark usually is the shadow. So I call them shadow shapes. But if you look on a mountain and you see the shadow, you can, and if you can paint that color, that's giving you the puzzle piece to all of those shadows coming forward. So if you get those in, you've got atmosphere. And then it's just the details. The details are being applied to those shadow shapes, which already hold that object in its location. So, so then no matter what detail you put on there, it's going to read atmospherically because of those shadow shapes. And that's a nutshell. When you're doing the workshop, is the approach that you're going to take as if we were doing something plein air or yes. like if we were studio painting? Absolutely. It's going to be because I paint with the same principles in the studio. So we'll take a photo and I'll identify the shadow shapes on each plane. When I demo, I'll, I'll identify them for you. And then at least we'll know what we're aiming for. Now, all of our color sensibilities will be a little different, but at least we know what shape we're trying to mix, what color we're trying to mix. And then we can move through the landscape. I usually move through it from background to foreground. Some people like to go foreground to background, but those relationships are the same. So we're, we're, we're speaking the same language. It's just someone might go from one direction to the other but all the comparisons are going to be the same. But, you know, and, and I, I've i talked a little bit about detail, not detail. And to me, that's um, that doesn't have any relevance in the start. The start for me is always the same. How far I take it varies from painting to painting. But you can get as hyper-realistic with detail as you want or you may find, like I found, that sometimes less detail has more of an impact. Do you generally paint uh, large or or smaller six by eights, eight by tens when you're doing outdoor studies? Outdoor studies, I paint small. Um, I will show. I'm going to show that. I realized it didn't show before, <laughs> so let me. I'm going to pull up this. Give me one second here. This is where we need some, um, some like some music. So <laughs> used to be a singer. Yeah. <laughs> like what's that game show song? That's what we need. <laughs> Oh, do you add do you add more color into your rocks to add a little more life to the painting or do you paint them as you see them you know i i paint them as i see them but i see them differently now that that's the funny thing about you know all these years of painting is what i saw 10 years ago is very different than what i see now so the color in rocks um i used to always see them as warm and they'd almost always be orange and then I started thinking that as that rock tilts towards the sky, it's reflecting that bluish light of the sky. So there's always a little bit of blues and grays, even on the warm surface. So on the warm side of rocks, the light side of rocks, there's still other colors besides orange or, you know, whatever rock color it is. So, so I see a lot more rock color than I used to. And I think that's a, it's a fun place to be to start being able to really analyze colors. I think when you first start painting, it's overwhelming because there's a lot of things to juggle. You know, there's not just drawing, there's color now. Uh, with a pencil, it's like, okay, I got the drawing and the values. That's that's all you need. Uh, with paint, there's a whole nother element, and that's getting those values accurate with color. And so that's a you know, one thing that I'm trying in my workshops to simplify that a little bit. Do you have any tricks for that? 
when it comes to color and finding the value? Um, squinting is really the, the best thing. Um, you know, sometimes I, I saw Eric Rhodes wearing those big goofy red glasses mm -hmm. and I, and I like those. <laughs> so, you know, those red filtered glasses could, could actually work too. It's just some, um, that to me is the most difficult part about painting is translating color to value and some colors it's a breeze, you know, ultramarine blue, you know, that's a pretty dark value. Um, but reds sometimes can play tricks on you. Yellows can play tricks on you. And so those are, you know, practice with those is really the, the biggest thing, but you were going to show us something, right? Yeah. Let me, let me see if I was able to pull this up. Any other questions in the meantime? I have a question on brush strokes. Yeah. Um, I think of your brush strokes and uh, the word that comes to mind is lush. And uh, I'm wondering if that came naturally or have you developed that over time? It did because when I first started painting, I didn't want to have anything to do with brushwork. I wanted it to look like a photo. And mm -hmm. it, my um, appreciation for that um, happened when I was looking at some of the Russian impressionist work and, and then I really started being enamored with it. But, it, but again, it wasn't on purpose. A lot of, and it's what I tell my students is don't think about it. It's like a signature. If you think about it, you're going to be too careful with it. But if you don't think about it, you just write your name and that's it. And most of us don't think about signing our name. We just sign it. And if you don't think about brushwork, but just let your hand do what it needs to do to get the job done, think about the color, but don't think about the brushwork. You'll have brushwork by not thinking about it, and it'll be your signature. And that's where I'm at now. I don't even think about it. I don't think I've got to have this even brushwork. I'm like, I need this color there. Grab the color, stick it there. And a lot of time, my hand is just going fast. So it, it, um, Sometimes it's sloppy and I, and I don't have a, a cure for that. I just go with it because eventually it turns into a scene. So, but that would be my advice. Don't think about it. Just let your hand do what it, it needs to do to get the job done. Do you copy the colors that you're seeing outside or are you changing those as you're painting? I'm copying the color fairly precisely. So I'm, I'm really trying to, in, in color, meaning the atmosphere. Um, so, you know, I, I'm I'm trying to avoid being fooled by color. A lot of times when I use, you know, if I'm painting a fall scene and I see a bright yellow tree on a distant hill, my tendency is to grab yellow, but that's not in context. If I if I bring it into context with a yellow tree in the foreground, suddenly that background yellow isn't yellow anymore. You know, that background yellow is maybe a great version of yellow. And that's what separates it from the foreground. So um, in, in essence, I, I paint what I see, but now I know what I'm seeing. And I think that's a huge difference. So this was that scene that I sent Charlie Hunter for a little interview. So funny. And of course it's Photoshop. Mm -hmm. And the giveaway is how giant my tripod is. But <laughs> I posted this on Facebook maybe five years ago. And I had to answer so often, how do I pack a painting that big? And, uh, you know, people believe that I even got calls from, or uh, messages from gallery owners wanting to represent me because I painted this big outdoors. So <laughs> I don't, I mean, to, to answer the question earlier, this is a nine by 12. I usually paint nine by 12, 12 by 16, somewhere in that range. So, um, and these are just a few, this is an older painting, The Coming Rain, which um, it, it's about six years old, but it, it's one of those pieces that, you know, I felt, you know, really, I turned a corner on it. This is beautiful. This one's fairly recent. Beautiful. Um, 
I had one in here. Um, this is a very, this one is actually right behind me. And I don't know if I can zoom in on that. We've no. got about five minutes left, Dave, just so you know. Okay, this is great. Um, on my Instagram page, I zoomed in on this. You know, Scott and I were just talking about brushwork. And if you get on my Instagram page, you, you can see this section zoomed in and it shows a bit more about that, the brushwork. Uh, yeah. Nice. Uh, may I say something? Yeah, sure. I, I, I've, I've studied with Dave and um, one of the things that spoke to me was how he could... Study, wait, studied, drank... <laughs> partied with hung out because you were in mexico for sure yeah, it was a, it was it was a good workshop <laughs> and galley and <laughs> yeah it was fun yeah um one of the things that spoke to me with dave was the 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 online world well i fell asleep during his presentation his a video presentation and i've seen it before on oil painters of america was that how to mm -hmm. see that atmosphere perspective in terms of the color swatches and when you put the same gray in front of a yellow and in front of a blue whoa, yeah. you know and that's an age-old thing but if some of us don't haven't seen that that's yeah. huge so some of your you know your intuitive stuff is just unfolds and your 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 teaching is awesome that technical stuff just like on screen and seeing color and explain that explaining that technical um atmospheric re recession or you know forward stuff yeah um really spoke to me and and helped me understand That's well great. thanks and uh, you know it's, it's all developed because i and i'm mostly self-taught and i use that not um I've never taken workshops, but I've read a lot. And so a lot of this is how I taught myself, yeah. you know, something I'm always about, it's got to make sense. There, there's something I'm missing. Why, why is this painting working yeah. and this one isn't? Yeah. And I'm very analytical that way. I'll look at yeah. two paintings, one works, one doesn't, and try and figure out why, why isn't it working? Right. And all of that comes back to teaching because it's how I teach now. If I learn something, it goes immediately into my workshops. I don't. Absolutely. And and you learn so much from teaching. Yeah, absolutely. It's yeah, just it's like... huge. Yep. It is right. huge. Yeah. Um, Any final questions or comments? Will this be recorded? So if we want to share it with our friends, yes. they can watch it. Yes, awesome. this is going to be posted on um, the Mastery's YouTube channel. If you just type in YouTube, meet the men or you know go into youtube and search on meet the mentor you'll see several of these different interviews i don't know it'll probably take them a couple of days to upload it but um it will be there so, thank you you're nice. all gonna be famous oh nice. well thank you guys thanks everyone for for coming out and asking great questions and and hopefully i get to see you if not in march down the road yeah, it's going to be a great time. Um, I think it's going to really be fun. Learn a lot. So hope to see you all there. And Dave, thank you so much for your generosity and your time. And thank you to everyone for sticking through this until the end. And uh, goodbye to all my homies in California. <laughs> yeah, stay dry. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you guys. Awesome. Looking right. forward Thanks to all. All right. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.